things theology, all things theology We chop it up properly, without an apology Gotta give doxology to God hollow Because this is how we do it at all things theology Sometime yesterday, I, I got started getting a lot of links that talked about Marcus Rogers and I and a, a brief video denying the Trinity. And I, I'm like, okay, you can find this material being posted 20 times a day across YouTube. I mean, the amount of anti-Trinitarian material out there is massive. And so I started contacting a few folks and basically asking, so why is why is this guy relevant? Why why does this matter? Um, uh, you know what what's 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 going on with with all of this? And what ended up coming back is that he is a quote Christian artist, Christian rapper, and that the response that had been given to him had been posted because he had so many likes on a on the Facebook version of this video. So, you know, I'm thankful that there are Christian artists out there who are extremely focused upon the content of their material. Everybody knows Shailen and everybody knows the, the depth of the theology, you know, lyrical theology and stuff like that. Ivy Connerly, we've worked with him, and you know the, the depth of of doctrinal truth and content that's put in there. But let's be honest. Obviously, if if this gentleman is getting a whole bunch of likes and followers when he's not a Trinitarian and in fact believes the Trinity is wrong, once again, the fact that entertainment is not the same thing as worship is brought to the fore. Because worship is based upon God's truth, what he has revealed concerning himself. And just as, you know, uh, Phillips, Craig, and Dean went around for years and years and years, and nobody could care less that they weren't Trinitarians, or at, at the very least, some of them don't know one way or the other. You know, I, I, how do you lead people in worship when you don't know who God is? Uh, those who lead in worship, and of course, I have extreme problems with the idea that the musical element of the worship service is the worship, and then the worship stops, and the preaching begins, and that's not worship. No, that's backwards. <laughs> the, the, the music is preparatory, and the uh, actual worship is the proclamation of God's truth. Anyway, so Marcus Rogers uh, posts this video, and it's extremely small. Uh, small, short, I apologize. It's extremely short. And uh, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna play the whole thing and let you listen to it, and then we're gonna respond to it. Just pretty much that simple. Uh, clearly the gentleman is a modalist evidently was at least at one time a member of a oneness Pentecostal type church. And so it's a Sabalian. This is the Sabalian modalistic denial of the Trinity. That is a uh, Unitarian understanding that affirms the deity of Christ. But to affirm the deity of Christ, you have to deny the deity of the Son. So in other words, the Son is not an eternal person uh, who is in communion with the Father. Instead, the, the Son is a created being, comes into existence at his birth in Bethlehem. Obviously, this gentleman is not a theologian and has not received any formal theological training. I was disappointed at some of the things that I saw in Twitter. Some people were saying somebody needs to smack him outside the head. He's a heretic, blah, blah, blah. No, you correct the heresy. You pray for repentance. You speak the truth. You don't smack people upside the head or all the rest of this silliness. Um, God's truth should not be handled in that way. My goodness. Uh, so, come on, people. But I'm, I'm having to feed it to you with part of my desktop background, which it's just one of my fractals. So 
don't blame me for the colorful nature. Of the, but for some reason, and we could not figure out why, if I think it's because it's turned, you know, like you're holding your phone like this, so it's taller than it is wider. My, the, the way my program communicates, the program in there that gets it out onto the feed and stuff, didn't like that. And and ended up going and making the guy look like he's a sumo wrestler or something, which he's not. So, so I said, nah, I don't want to do that. So there's going to be a background, and that's the only way we could make it the actual size. So here we go. It's only, it's, it's only just under three minutes long. So even I can get through a three-minute video fairly quickly. But he does talk fast. So anyways, here, here, here we go. So um, it recently came to my attention. These guys were putting a radio show together. They were saying that I was dangerous to Christianity. I was teaching a false doctrine and they needed to expose me, you know, so I have a lot of patience. So I went and I talked to guys and I said, you know, what's wrong with what I'm preaching, what I'm posting? What is your issue? Come to find out these guys were Trinitarian. So I said, you know what? This is a quick fix. We can get in the word of God to see what the truth is. So let's hit it. Matthew 28 and 19, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. All right, check this out, guys. It's basic English right here. In the name, singular, of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. If you went to the bank, if I went to the bank and they asked me to sign a check in my name, I wouldn't sign Father. I wouldn't sign Son because those are not names. Those are titles. I would sign Marcus Rogers, which is my name. I wouldn't sign my duty position in the army. I wouldn't sign that I was a janitor. All right, now, now notice it's singular. It doesn't say names. It says name because there's one. They don't have, they're not separate beings. All right. And a uh, second thing is, where do you even see the word Trinity in the Bible? That is a man-made word because it's a man-made false doctrine. We can even hit the Old Testament, Isaiah 45 and 5. I am the Lord and there is no other apart from me. There is no God. I will strengthen you though you have not acknowledged me. Verse 6, so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, people may know there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. God is saying there's nobody else up here. When I formed the earth, when I sat on my throne, there's nobody at my left. There's no nobody at my right. There's nobody up here with me. I am God and I'm God alone. Jesus said in John 10 verse 30, I am the fa I am the father are one. All right, Deuteronomy 6 and 4, hear O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. I understand something. All right, the father, the son, the Holy Ghost, John chapter 1. Uh, God stepped off the throne and he sent down Jesus. God couldn't come down in his full glory and walk this earth because, man, we wouldn't be able to handle it. So he took a part of him and he put it in Jesus, his son, and he sent him down to die for our sins. All right. And when Jesus died and he rose from the dead and he was ascending back into heaven, he told the apostles not to worry. He would send a comforter. He would send a part of him to live inside of us, which is his Holy Spirit, which is the Holy Ghost. There is no separate being. They are all God. They are are all one. All right. But he put a part of him, his Holy Spirit inside of us. He put a part of um, him on this earth to walk this earth and to die for our sins. I'm not going to argue. I'm going to leave it at that. We can go back and forth in the comments. And I've got plenty of more scriptures that I will post for in the comments. You guys be blessed. Have a wonderful day. I love you. The truth will set you free. And I promise I love you guys. I'm preaching nothing but the truth. I'm preaching straight from the word of God. There is no Trinity. There is no three separate beings. There is only Jesus Christ. He is the way be blessed okay well uh, of course there are not three separate beings which immediately demonstrates that mr rogers has no earthly idea what the doctrine of the trinity is in the first place but that's not unusual um if you were raised in a uh, pentecostal holiness oneness movement type thing we cannot expect that this gentleman is going to have an accurate knowledge of the doctrine of the trinity given his background so uh, a number of times he said, well, there's not three beings. And of course, we don't believe there are three beings. Um, he doesn't understand the difference between being and person. So clearly he's never studied the doctrine. He doesn't know what the doctrine is. He calls it man-made, but he's just simply repeating uh, the same stuff that he's been taught in, in his church. And I understand that. My hope is that he will take the time to listen. Uh, if you would like us to send him a copy of The Forgotten Trinity, uh, my book on the subject that many, many people have read, uh, we'll be glad to do so. If you can just, just contact us, let us know where to send it. Uh, we, of course, do address uh, modalism, uh, Sabellianism, oneness Pentecostalism uh, in, uh, in the book. And I did send to him because he tweeted me. He said, well, if you 
do a video. I'll do a video to refute you. It's like, okay, fine. Uh, you go ahead and do that. Um, but I also sent links uh, to a link to the debate that we did in uh, Brisbane, Australia, rather full uh, discussion of this particular issue. I noted that with that, there were also links, for example, to the little radio discussion uh, with Dr. Bernard was on there. Uh, we also have at least part of the debate from 1999 with Saban, only the first half. We've never found the second half of that debate anywhere. Um, but uh, I think the audio may exist someplace, but the video doesn't. Anyway, uh, so we've, we've debated this a number of, of times before. It's not, not our first go around. But you have clear misunderstanding on his part as to what the doctrine of uh, the Trinity actually is. So let's, uh, let's go back here uh, and let's go point by point through and respond to what... Now, now people are saying, is this guy performing Dawa? No. Folks, listen. Did you hear what he was saying? See, if you think that... If you, I, I'm seeing a bunch of people in channel and on Twitter. Oh, he sounds like a Muslim. No, he doesn't. If you think that's a Muslim, you don't understand what the Muslims or the Oneness Pentecostals believe. You weren't listening. Sorry. Sorry. Don't mean to pick on you. You didn't hear him quoting Matthew 28, 19 to 20? Saying that a part, that God sent a part of himself and put it in Jesus? No Muslim's ever going to say that. Now, now, he is not giving us a David Bernard level representation of Oneness Pentecostalism either. Um... It almost sounds, from his perspective, like God can be chopped up into little parts, and part went into Jesus, and part goes into us, and that's not even one of Pentecostals. I mean, I mean, this guy's sort of making it up as he's going along here. Obviously, he's just going with what he's heard in his tradition, in his background, and isn't even rec representing his own position uh, accurately. But you've got to hear the difference. No Muslim would ever say what he just said about Jesus. Um... The, he is a Unitarian, but the, the modalists are Unitarians, but they're Unitarians by denying the deity of Christ. The modalists are Unitarians by denying the existence of multiple divine persons. So the Son becomes two persons in, in at least Orthodox UPCI teaching, if you can use the term orthodox, um, to where the Father indwells the human being who is the Son. So the prayer life of Jesus becomes the human side of Jesus praying to the divine side of Jesus, which is the creation, the created be a person, the Son, praying to the uncreated Father, who then, after the resurrection, becomes the Holy Spirit. But it's only just one divine person taking different roles. And the, the Muslim would never say that. Never say that at all. So, got to listen close here, folks. Got to listen close to what's actually being said. Here we go. So, um, it recently came to my attention, these guys were putting a radio show together. They were saying that I was dangerous to Christianity. I was teaching a false doctrine, and they needed to expose me. Now, let me just mention something. I would agree with them. If you're not a Trinitarian, this is the dividing line. This is what defines Christianity versus what is not. If you do not have the Son, you do not have the Father either. Um, and oneness Pentecostals, likewise. I mean, if you're saying this is a man-made doctrine, you're saying this is, this is completely false, it's not biblical, then we are all grossly misrepresenting God. This is a dividing line. This is, a, this is not something where we all go, ah, it's no big deal. We can, we can just you know, get past this. No, this is a real dividing line. This is something that is vitally important. You know, so I have a lot of patience. So I went and I talked to guys and I said, you know, what's wrong with what I'm preaching, what I'm posting? What is your issue? Come to find out these guys were Trinitarian. So I said, you know what? This is a quick fix. We can get in the word of God to see what the truth is. So let's hit it. A uh, quick fix. Well, it would be a quick fix if, sir, you understood, um, Marcus, the, the doctrine of the Trinity, which clearly you do not. The doctrine of the Trinity is that within the one being that is God, there eternally exists three co-equal and co-eternal persons, namely the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's not that there are three beings 
who are one being or three persons who are one person. The distinction that is necessarily made because we make this distinction every day in our lives is between being and person. There is only one being of God. When you quote from Isaiah 45, you're, you're preaching to the choir. You're assuming that Yahweh is unipersonal, unitarian, but you don't prove it. And the real issue, Marcus, is whether the Bible teaches that the Son, as a divine person, pre-existed his birth, his incarnation, in Bethlehem. That's the issue, Marcus. Because from what you're saying is the Son was at best an idea, but is not an eternal divine person. You believe there's only one divine person. We believe there are three divine persons and one divine being. Why do we believe this? Because the Bible forces us to believe this. Forces us to believe this. So before we go to Matthew 28, let me explain to you why when we see Matthew 28, we see it in light of Matthew chapter 3, which does come before that, the baptism narrative of Jesus, where you have the Father speaking from heaven. Jesus was not a ventriloquist. You have the Father speaking from heaven. You have the Son being baptized. You have the Spirit descending as a dove. At the end of the Gospel, we are baptized in the name, singular, and by the way, English is irrelevant. Uh, the Bible was written before there was an English language, but the term anima is singular in Matthew chapter 28. But it doesn't say Jesus. There is one divine name being referred to, but it's not squishing Father, Son, and Spirit into one person, because even you don't have that. There was never a time in Jesus' experience where he's Father, Son, and Spirit. And so, and it's not dividing it out to where you have three different persons. The use of the singular name, but being baptized into that name is very important, but you're assuming something that is completely contradictory to the rest of what the Bible teaches. And I believe in what I believe because I believe in only Scripture and all of Scripture. And I do not believe that you can deal with all of Scripture. And let me give you a foundational evidence of that. If people have their Bibles, um, turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 17. The position that Marcus is presenting cannot survive, cannot survive a, an examination of the Gospel of John. It just, it just, it's just not possible. It can't do it. Because the distinction between the Father and the Son is plainly and clearly made there. By the way, someone just asked in, in Twitter, could we say this? Trinity equals mind, Father, body, Christ, Spirit, Holy Ghost, Spirit, one being, three persons. No. <laughs> N-O, unorthodox. Um, here's what we have in John chapter 17, beginning at verse 3. This is the eternal life. They may know you, the only true God, this is Jesus speaking, may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Now, how can a Unitarian modalistic understanding explain these words? Jesus is clearly referring to someone other than himself. He is saying that they may know you. Now, is this an internal conversation? Is Jesus schizophrenic here? Is Jesus going that they may know you? Yeah, me. No. Jesus is praying to the Father. He uses personal pronouns of the Father. And he says the Father is the only true God. And to have eternal life, you must know, 
Two things, the Father and the Son, whom the Father has sent. Now, my Muslim friends deny the deity of Christ based on this because they assume Unitarianism and say, well, if the Father is the only true God, then Jesus isn't the Father, therefore he's not God. Assuming Unitarianism rather than proving Unitarianism. The reality is there is only one true God. We are all, mo well, we are all monotheists, leaving all our, Muslim fr our Mormon friends off to the side. We are all monotheists. There is only one true God. And to know eternal life requires that you know the one true God. But Jesus, amazingly, unlike any prophet ever before him, says, actually, you need to know the Father and the Son. And in describing himself, he says, I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. The cross is, a, is an accomplished reality from Jesus' perspective in this prayer. It's going to happen. It's going to be successful. But notice, in verse 4, the Son glorifies the Father on earth. What is the request of the Son of the Father in verse 5? Now, Father, glorify me. I glorified you. I've accomplished the task that you sent me to accomplish. Now, Father, glorify me. Now, this is a prayer, but it is in the imperative. Now, there's a special kind of imperative in prayer. It's a, uh, you know, but there is a, a sense in which I've glorified you. Now you glorify me. Together with yourself, not separate from you, not, not in distinction from you, but Father, glorify me together with yourself in what way? With the glory which I had in your presence. Uh, specifically, para seauto, para seauto, by your side, in your presence before the world was. Now, here is the key, Marcus. Because in UPCI theology, in oneness theology, the Son did not have a personal existence in the presence of the Father. Now, the best they've ever come up with, and it's just absolute desperation, is to say, well, the Son was a plan in the Father's mind. The Father planned for the Incarnation. However you understand that. The Father planned for the ministry of Jesus. And that plan was glorious. But that's not what Jesus says, is it? No. He says, Glorify me now, Father. Para seauto in your presence, te doxe, he icon, the glory which I had. Is this a plan speaking? Do plans speak? Of course not. This is a person speaking. And he's speaking of a time, pra tu tan kasman ainai, before the world was. This is a person speaking to another person, the Greek pronouns are plain. In any other context, there would be no question about this. And he's speaking of a time when one person was in the presence of another person and those two persons shared the same glory, which now the second person is asking to receive once again. That's what's being said here. That's what's being said here. Now, I've seen the best that the modalists have to offer. They cannot deal with this text. It just, it's just not possible. I mean, the, the, the desperation of the oneness Pentecostal's point, sad to observe. Sad to observe. All right? You tie this together with Philippians chapter 2, where the Son makes himself of no reputation. 
He does not consider the equality he has with the father something to be grasped. Plans don't have equality with the father, Marcus. He has equality with the father. He lays that aside in service to others, takes on human flesh. So here is a divine person thinking, considering before the incarnation, then acting in bringing about the incarnation by taking on that human nature. Clearly, two divine persons in view. And any biblical evidence demonstrating that the Son, as a divine person, pre-exists his birth in Bethlehem is the end of modalism. It's the end of modalism. That's it. You have to give it up. You have to give it up. So, with that in mind, then, we can look at all the places where the three persons are brought together in Matthew chapter 28. But we have to maintain the distinction between the persons because the Bible teaches it. Even in John chapter 10, let's go ahead and get that. We've already talked about Matthew 28, but I'm, I'm Matthew 28 and 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. All right, check this out, guys. It's basic English right here. In the name, singular, of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. If you went to the bank, if I went to the bank and they asked me to sign a check in my name, I wouldn't sign Father. I wouldn't sign Son because those are not names. Those are titles. I would sign Marcus Rogers, which is my name. I wouldn't sign my duty position in the army. I wouldn't. Okay. Um, so why is it that Jesus so often refers to himself as the Son of Man, the Son of God? It's not a matter of signing checks. It's a matter of what authority is being given. Well, first of all, Jesus says he has all authority in heaven and earth. And this is, this is post-resurrection. So who is he now? Where, where is this divine person who has all authority? Where is he? What's he doing? He's not the, is he, he's not the Spirit, because the Son is not the Spirit and one that's Pentecost. The Father is now taking the role of the Spirit. So what's Jesus doing? Th these are, uh, again, if you, the, the two things, sola scriptura, scripture alone, tota scriptura, all of scripture. You may believe in the sola part, you don't believe the tota part. You're not believing the testimony of the scriptures to the existence of three divine persons. You're just you're just rejecting it. And and maybe you just haven't been faced with it before. It's hard, it's hard for me to believe, but it, it's possibility. And that I was a janitor. All right, now notice it's singular. It doesn't say names. It says name because there's one. They don't have, they're not separate beings, all right? And us. We don't believe in separate beings, Marcus. You're saying, you're what you're trying to say, I think, is they're not separate persons. They are. Jesus used personal pronouns of someone other than himself. You have to explain that. You have to explain the constant, consistent differentiation of the divine person of the Son from the divine person of the Father. It's there in Scripture over and over and over again, and you're ignoring it. Thing is, where do you even see the word Trinity in the Bible? That is there are all sorts of words that we use, Marcus that are not found in the Bible. The issue is, do they represent the teaching of the Bible? There's all sorts of discussion of theocracy. There's all sorts of discussion of uh, theonomy. These are not terms that are used in the Bible, but they are terms that are relevant to our understanding of the categories of what the Bible teaches. Uh, oneness Pentecostalism isn't found in the Bible either. Uh, neither is rap, uh, just to mention it man-made word because it's a man-made false doctrine we can even hit the old testament isaiah 45 and 5 i am the lord and there's no other apart from me there is no god i will strengthen you though you have not acknowledged me verse 6 so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting people may know there is none besides me i am the lord and there is no other god is saying there's nobody else up here when i formed the earth when i sat on my throne there's nobody at my left there's nobody at my right there's nobody up here with me i am god and i'm God alone. Jesus. Now notice, notice the assumption you're making, Marcus, is Unitarianism. We believe what Isaiah 45 says. I have quoted Isaiah 43, 44, 45, over and over and over again, the trial of the false gods. 
only one true God. But then you have to continue from there. That's the being of God. Is that being of God shared by one person or three persons? And the New Testament revelation is three, not one. Distinction of Father, Son, and Spirit, and yet the identification of the Son as Yahweh. Hebrews chapter 1, John chapter 12. Not just representing Yahweh, but as Yahweh. As being immutable, unchangeable. You're only grabbing little pieces here. And you're pitting them against other parts of the scriptures. That's why your position is untenable and cannot survive cross-examination. In John 10, verse 30, I and the, fa I am the Father are one. Isn't it amazing? It, it seems to me like that, that you and T.D. Jakes um, don't want it to be I and the Father. You want it to be I am the Father. That's not what Jesus said, Marcus. And if you look a little closer, look at the original. The verb is plural in John 10, 30. Not only in the preceding context has Jesus plainly distinguished between himself and the Father. Plainly distinguished between himself and the Father. But when he says, I and the Father, we are one. Esmen. He doesn't say, I and the Father, we is one. We are. Plural. Not singular. You, you brought up the singular, singular in Matthew 28. Great. Why not bring up, the, bring up the plural in John 10? Because it distinguishes between the Father and the Son. I and the Father, we are one in bringing about the salvation of God's people. The text is not saying, I am the Father. That is a gross misrepresentation of what Jesus is saying in John chapter 10. It ignores the preceding verses where he has distinguished himself from the Father. You cannot walk through the Gospel of John and come up with the idea that I am the Father because that's simply not what it teaches. Deuteronomy 6 and 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And of course, we believe that. But you are assuming that echad means oneness of person rather than oneness of being. Because you don't understand the doctrine you're denying. When people make arguments that the people they're arguing against go, Yeah, yeah, we believe that. Yeah, yeah, we believe that. That's de generally a demonstration of the fact that they're arguing against a straw man that they haven't taken the time to understand what it is they're denying. Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. Believe it. Believe it firmly. But I just believe all the New Testament then reveals as to how that one God, Yahweh, has revealed himself. And it's not in the way that you are suggesting. Understand something, all right? The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, John chapter 1. Uh, God stepped off the throne and he sent down Jesus. God couldn't come down in his full glory and walk this earth because, man, we wouldn't be able to handle it. So he took a part of him and he put it in Jesus. His now, now, where are you getting this? He took a part of him. So so uh, God God can sort of just uh, chop himself up and, and send a part off this way and a part off that way? That is, that is not Christian theology. Uh, nowhere. Does the Bible ever speak of dividing God up into pieces and parts? John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word is with God, and the Word was God. The Word is distinguished from God here. It's not a part that's sent off someplace. This is a person. It's that, that Logos that is going to become flesh in verse 14, and then verse 18 is going to specifically tell us we're talking about Father and Son. No one has seen God in any time. The monogamous Theos, the unique God who is in the bosom of the Father, that is in the closest personal relationship with the Father, he has made him known, not himself known. Not himself known. That's what the prologue of John is all about. So the, the prologue says nothing about taking parts off and putting them in Jesus or anything like that. It's, it's not even close to what's actually being said.
and he sent him down to die for our sins, all right? And when Jesus died and he rose from the dead and he was ascending back into heaven, he told the apostles not to worry. He would send a comforter. He would send a part of him to live inside of us, which is... That's not what Jesus said. Uh, John 14, John 16, he didn't say I'm going to send a part of me. He says, I and the Father, we will send the Spirit who will be another comforter. It doesn't say we're going to chop another part off and send, send that part on. The Spirit is identified as a person. The Spirit is sent by the Father and the Son. But if you believe the Son is just a human being indwelt by God, how does God and a human being send God, who is the Father, but then becomes the Spirit? I mean, uh, how, does, how does that work? It, it, it doesn't work. Holy Spirit, which is the Holy Ghost. There is no separate being. They are all God. They are all one. Uh, there's no separate being. We don't believe in a separate being. There is only one being of God. God's being can't be chopped up into three parts, ten parts, hundred parts, any other parts. God's being is simple, non-complex, cannot be chopped up into parts, sliced off, and do, do things like you're seemingly suggesting that that they did, but that's not the biblical teaching. I, but he put a part of him, his Holy Spirit, inside of us. He put a part of um, him on this earth to walk this earth and to die for our sins. I'm not going to argue. I'm going to leave it at that. We can go back and forth in the comments, and I've got plenty of more scriptures that I will post for in the comments. Plenty of more scriptures, but you haven't given any that even begins to substantiate your position. Because, A, you don't understand the position you're denying. You've misrepresented it. And the texts that you cited are either irrelevant because they're proving monotheism and we are monotheists, or you've misrepresented what they're actually saying. It doesn't say I and the Father, we are one person, or anything even close to that. Okay? So, there you go. It was a quick video, quick response. The question really will be, Marcus, are you willing to learn? Are you willing to actually find out what the Doctrine of the Trinity is and why it is that Christians have believed it all the way back to the earliest records we have outside the New Testament. Oh yeah, all the way back. Go back to Ignatius, Bishop of Antioch. Read what he read, what he said. I've, I, I know some liberals try to say he was a modalist. He wasn't. He clearly distinguished between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And yet, at the same time, he affirmed the deity of Christ, just like me, but not like you. So, are you willing to learn? Are you willing to do some study? Are you willing to go, hey, you know, folks, you know what? I'm not a theologian, but everyone's called to be one. And so, I spoke out of turn, and I'm willing to, I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to, I'm willing to be corrected. Are you willing to do that? That really is the question, Marcus, that really is. There's a lot of other stuff I wanted to get to today, but I am not overly surprised that I took up all the time plus a couple minutes, but that's how it goes. So thanks for watching Dividing Lines.